We'll go with clock on the wall. Glad to see you all here this evening. If you're worshiping with us online, thank you for, for being with us also. As always, we'll have more announcements uh, at the end of service. If you're visiting with us, please uh, fill out a visitor's card, place it in the question plate to be out in the foyer. We'd love to have a record of your presence and have an opportunity to send you a, a card uh, thanking you for your time with us here today. Also, a reminder, please silent cell phones. And we will cover more announcements at the end of service. Let's go to God in prayer. Almighty Father, again, we come before you today praising your name and thanking you so much for the blessings that you've given to us. We thank you for Jesus. We're so grateful that he was our example while here on this earth. He's our Savior in his death, burial, and resurrection. We pray, Father, that we always count that blessing as the most precious thing in our lives, the most important thing that we have. And Father, the, the thing that we have committed our lives to you over through the promise that his sacrifice will give us hope of eternal life if we are but obedient to your will. We pray, Father, that we do the best we can to serve you in every aspect of our lives. Now during this hour, we pray that our worship to you will be pleasing and that you will be glorified by the things we say and do. And Father, we pray that you'll please be with each one here, whether members be physically suffering, spiritually suffering, grieving from the loss of loved ones, or in whatever need that they may have that we may not be aware of. We pray, Father, that we do our best to to reach out and, and help each other with our needs. And Father, we pray that you through your providence will always take care of us. And Father, we trust you and we, we love you and we know that you love us. We pray, Father, that as we go throughout this day, the rest of our lives, that we will live in such a way so that when the judgment day comes, you will find us faithful so that we may be with you for eternity. We give us first name in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Good evening. May you please grab a songbook and turn to number ten. Number ten one zero. If you are online, we are singing out of the songs of the church. All to Jesus I surrender. One zero. Oh, to Jesus I surrender all, to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence.
song before the lesson will be number 337. 337. Lo, in the grave he lay. Again, that is 337. Lo, in the grave he lay. Lo, in the grave he lay. Jesus, my Savior, waiting the coming day. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave he arose with a mighty triumph for his foe. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lived forever with his name to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ arose. Death cannot keep his praise, Jesus. My Savior, He tore the bars away. Jesus, my Lord, up from the grave He arose with the mighty triumph for His foe. He arose a victor from the dark domain, and he lived forever with his thanks to reign. He arose, he arose, hallelujah, Christ The scripture reading for this evening will be from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 3. Again, that is 1 Peter, chapter 3. I'll be reading verses 20 through 22. Again, I will be reading 1 Peter, chapter 3, verses 20 through 22, and I will be reading in the King James Version. which sometime were disobedient, when once the long-suffering of God waited in the days of Noah. While the ark was in a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls, were saved by water. The like figure, whereunto even baptism doth also now save us. Not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone unto heaven and is on the right hand of God, angels and authorities and powers being made subject to him. Sometimes it seems like we are especially intrigued by things that are unusual, things that are rare, the oldest, the newest, the fastest, the slowest, whatever it is. Well, this sermon tonight is not going to be about one of those things. <laughs> it's going to be about something that's very common, very ordinary. In fact, it's one of the most ordinary, most plentiful things around us. If you look at the earth from space, this is what you primarily see. If you analyze the body, it's primarily made of this, which is obviously water. 71% of the earth is covered with water. 60% of the human body is made of water. 82% of our blood is water. 70% of the brain is water. Although I miss, admit there are some days I feel a little more watered down than that. But water is common. Water is ordinary. 
And it is one of the things that we can see how God uses the ordinary to do extraordinary things. There are things that God has done that are recorded in the Bible that if we had been thinking about the situation, we might have expected God to do something truly extraordinary, something unusual, use something very different to accomplish his purpose. But sometimes he just used water. And he demonstrated his ability to use the ordinary in an extraordinary way. In fact, if we look back over history, I think that seems to be one of God's hallmarks. He takes the common and brings forth unusual results from it. So this evening I want us to talk about the way that God has used water to accomplish extraordinary purposes. He put water almost three-fourths of the surface of the earth, but there are other places that he put water. One of the places he put water was between Noah and a wicked world. The days of Noah, the people were wicked. Now, sometimes we think we live in wicked times. I think around here in this part of the part of the United States, we feel like maybe we don't have quite as much wickedness as they do in some other parts of the world, maybe even other parts of the United States. But we have people around us who are wicked, and they're doing wicked things. But the wickedness that we have is really not to be compared to the wickedness that exists in the days of Noah. In the days of Noah, almost all the people were almost completely wicked. Now, to some that would sound like an exaggeration, but what we find in Genesis 6-5, Then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Now, that's pretty thoroughly wicked. <laughs> but living in the midst of all of that wickedness was a righteous man, and you know the story, was Noah. He is described in Genesis 6, 9, Noah was a just man, perfect in his generation. Noah walked with God. But Noah, this just man, was an environment that was filled with wicked people. And, and I don't know how often we think about it this way. Perhaps we should think about it this way more often. Was that a threat to Noah? Was that a threat? Wickedness around him? Was that a threat to Noah and his family? Maybe to answer the question, we only have to think about Lot. What Lot lived in, a, in a, a wicked environment, a wicked surrounding. What happened to him? The wickedness that was around him so infiltrated his family, so permeated his family, that it was time for his family to get out. They didn't want to go. His daughters had intermarried with some of the wickedness that was around them. The wickedness that was around Lot was a threat to Lot and his family. And maybe it's not too much of a stretch by parallel to say that the wickedness that was around Noah was a threat to his, hit to his family and to him. So he was surrounded by the wickedness. Now, how is God going to rescue Noah from that wickedness? And we could think of several different ways, extraordinary ways. He could have whisked Noah and his family away in a chariot like he did Elijah. He could have brought death on all those people like he did to the firstborn in Egypt. He could have rained down fire like, on, like he did in Sodom and Gomorrah. But God didn't do any of those things, did he? He used something very simple. He used water to save them. God used water to separate Noah and his family from the wicked environment that was around him. That's what the Apostle Peter says, 1 Peter 3.20. He talks about the ark, and he says, in which few, that is, eight souls were saved by water. Now, I think we have to read that carefully. I think we kind of have a mindset that might make it difficult for us to grasp that. It did not say, it does not say that the ark saved the people from the water. That might be what you would expect it to say. That's not what it says. It says that eight people were saved by King James Version, or through the ark, through the water. We want to read carefully. Do we want to, we don't want to get the good things mixed up with the bad things? I think we do that sometimes. I, I commented before, I think we do that in, in, the, in the story of Jonah. We think about Jonah being swallowed by the big fish, and we say, oh no, Jonah was swallowed, swallowed by the big fish. How terrible. We should be thinking, yes, the big fish. The big fish is the hero. The threat was the water. The threat to Jonah's life was the water. The way that God saved him from that water was the big fish. The fish, big fish, was the good guy. It was not the bad guy. The fish was not the threat. 
The fish was what saved him from the threat. So back to the story of Noah. The water is the good guy, not the bad guy. The water was not the threat. The people were the threat. The water it was the Savior. First Peter 3.20 Few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. And maybe that's unexpected to us, but I think that's revealing. We have trouble, I think, viewing things through God's eye. Through God's eyes, the spiritual is always more important than the physical. God is much more interesting than saving the souls from the wickedness. So in a very unusual use of water, God put water between the righteous family and the unrighteous inhabitants around them. Is there any lesson that we should learn from this? Well, <laughs> should we take our church building and cover it inside and outside with tar? and floated out in the Gulf of Mexico to separate us and the wicked that live around us? No, that's not required. God accepts that in the course of living, in the course of living on this earth, we're going to have some encounters with those people who are wicked. We're going to have some encounters with those people who have worldly views. Paul wrote to the Corinthians not to keep company with sexually immoral people, but he explains, 1 Corinthians 5.10, Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexually immoral of this world or with the covetous are extortioners, are idolaters. Since then, you would have to go out of the world. In the context, Paul is commanding the Corinthians not to tolerate sexual immorality within the church, but he said if you were to try to avoid it in the world, you'd have to go out of the world. And I think when we look at the interactions we have with people around us, the question is, <laughs> when we're associating with them, which one is having the greater influence? Are they influencing us more for evil? Or are we influencing them more for good? Paul wrote to the Romans, Romans 12, 21, Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And I think in the end it's going to be one of those two alternatives. Either we're going to have the opportunity to do some good, even to the wicked people who are around us, or we're going to find out that they're having a greater influence on us. And if that other is true, if the people around us are beginning to influence us with their evil actions, their ideas, their doubts, then those people are dangerous to us. And we need to just get away from them. And maybe maybe we especially, or I do at least, think of young people. Yeah, I think we have some extraordinary young people in the congregation here. And I think they're mature enough to accept responsibility for themselves. A lot of young people will not separate themselves from the harmful influences around them unless their parents force them to. Well, that's not the way the young people should be. The young people should be mature enough to realize when people around them are having the wrong kind of influence on them and they should separate themselves from those people. Young people, be strong enough. Be mature enough to do that yourself. Don't wait till your parents figure it out. They may never figure it out. If you are determined to keep from your parents the, the morals of the kind of people you associate with, obviously to some great extent you can do that. So don't. Don't rely on them. You be the one who's mature enough. Stay away from the people who are bringing you down to a lower level. Same is true for adults. I guess maybe we have a greater expectation of adults than we do young people. I'm not so sure that's merited sometimes. I might have greater confidence in one of our young people or realize the situation and stay away from it than I would the general adult. Young or old, when the unspiritual thinking of the people who are around you, when that, un that kind of thinking begins to penetrate your thoughts, just get away. Separate yourself from it. That's what God did in the case of Noah. If you've got to build a boat and go float in the Gulf of Mexico, so be it. It's better than losing your soul. So God used water to separate Noah and his family from the evil around them. We need to be just as determined. Sometimes we, have, we may have to be just as creative. A second place that God put water was between bondage and freedom for the Israelites. The Israelites down in Egypt were in a bad set of circumstances. They were under the physical, emotional, spiritual stress, stress of their bondage. Exodus 3.23 says the children of Israel groaned because of the bondage. They cried out and their cry came up to God because of the bondage. They needed to be saved from their circumstances. 
They needed to get away from the Egyptians that were oppressing them. They needed to separate themselves from those Egyptians. God provided that deliverance. And they demanded that the Pharaoh release the people. Then there were the plagues. And there was the night of the last plague, the death of the firstborn. That was the night of their exit from Egypt. But after they left, Pharaoh changed his mind. And he sent his armies after the Israelites. And they would have caught them and they would have brought them back into bondage in Egypt except for one thing. What was the one thing that separated them, that saved them from being returned to that bondage? It was water. Of all the things that God could have used, he could have used all kinds of miraculous things. He could have used plagues upon the others. He could have used striking them dead. What God used was the very common element of water. Exodus 14, 26 through 28. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea, that the waters may come back upon the Egyptians. Then the water returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen and all the army of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them. The scripture says, not so much as one of them remained. God used ordinary water to do the extraordinary. Not the Israelite army, not the army of surrounding nations, not some miraculous nuclear bomb, but between freedom and bondage again in Egypt, what God used to separate them from, that was water, plain, simple water. And it turns out, not surprisingly, that that was a very impressive way to do that. Exodus 14, 31, Thus Israel saw the great work which the Lord had done in Egypt, so the people feared the Lord. I think maybe the lesson for us here is we need to trust God to do things his way. Sometimes I think we get our own expectations of how things should be done. Uh, sometimes there's a particular way that we have in mind and maybe we're surprised or disappointed if it doesn't occur that way. Haven't you heard prayers in which people ask God to do something and then the rest of the prayer, prayer was a very detailed set of instructions about how God should do that. I think we need to take a lesson from the unusual way God used water to spare the Israelites. God, God knows how to get things done. He knows how to bring about his will. Sometimes I think people lose trust in God, maybe they're even resentful of God if he doesn't do what they want in the way they want him to do it. God is very powerful. God is very creative. So, God does things in unexpected ways. Maybe that's a theme that goes through all the lessons tonight. Let us remember the very unusual, but the very effective way he used to keep those Israelites from being taken back into bondage. Third place that God put water was between impurity and purity and the life of Naaman. Naaman, the story is told in 2 Kings 5, powerful commander of the Syrian army. He is described as a man of valor, but he's also described as a leper. Leprosy was a terrible disease. It would just rot the parts of the body away sometimes until they fell off. And there were social implications too. Uh, they became an outcast of society. The fact that this man was continued to be a leader of the army with leprosy it's probably a double tribute to his character and his abilities. Well, eventually Naaman went to the house of Elisha, the prophet, and the prophet Elisha, no doubt based on what God had instructed him, told Naaman how to get rid of the leprosy. How was that going to happen? What was God going to do? What was God going to use to heal that man of that terrible disease? Some powerful ointment from a rare, disease, a rare tree? Was he going to use some powerful combination of whatever chemicals were available in that day? What was he going to use to separate this man from his disease? How about water? <laughs> Plain old river water. Elisha gave him instructions to wash himself in the Jordan seven times. First he resisted, but ultimately he did what he was told, and he was cleansed. Again, God used water in an extraordinary way. God used water to make pure that which had been unclean. Now, there's no suggestion here that there were some special properties in the water, but God used ordinary water in an extraordinary way. 
God seems to do that. God does that in many times, in many instances, so that his power will be recognized. His power will be seen. He wants there to be no misunderstanding of why the person was healed. There's no way anybody can point to any natural kind of healing here. It was the obedience to the things that God said. And it worked. Naaman returned to Elias, uh, Elias in 2 Kings 5.15 and said, Indeed, now I know that there is no God in all the earth except in Israel. How was Naaman cured? He was cured in water by obeying the instructions that God gave to the prophet. What's our lesson here? Even if God has an extraordinary plan to do an extraordinary thing, there are times that we need to cooperate with God's plan. Man must fulfill. Even when God's doing something extraordinary, sometimes he gives man a part to play in the accomplishment. And man must fulfill his part. Without Naaman's obedience to dipping in the water, that water would not have separated Naaman from the uncleanness. One final point, where does God put water? And I, I think you probably would have anticipated this point. God put water between sin and salvation. God uses the ordinary element of water to separate a person from sin and bring them into salvation. Sin's a terrible thing. Isaiah 59, 2, but your iniquities have separated you from your God. Sin is, in fact, many people have compared sin to leprosy. Sin is something that gets into you and eats you away spiritually, like leprosy eats you away physically. Sin is going to cost us our souls, Romans 6.23. The, the ultimate end of sin is death. We need to be separated from the guilt of those sins. And so what great and spectacular thing will God use to do that? <laughs> Water. Who would have thought to use plain, simple water? A dipping in water, an immersion in water, a burial in water. Romans 6, 4, and 5, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Baptism. The water of baptism washes away our sins, Acts 22, 16. A baptism is for the remission of sins, Acts 2, 38. Now that's extraordinary. It's so extraordinary that some people just refuse to accept it. I've said many times in talking to people, I think if God had said, well, sin is a terrible thing to get rid of the guilt of your sin, you need to take off your shoes and walk 20 feet over a bed of hot coals. People would have said, yeah, that sounds reasonable. Sure, I'll do that. But God used something so easy, so common, so ordinary. But that's the way God does things. Romans 6, 3, Galatians 3, 27 says that it's baptism that puts us into Christ. The scriptures do not teach any other way to get into Christ except to be baptized into Christ. Romans 6, 3, Galatians 3, 27. Or maybe even simpler than that, 1 Peter 3.21 just simply says, even now baptism does also now save us. But really, should we be so surprised that God used something so ordinary to, extra to, to, to bring about such an extraordinary result? He used the water to separate Noah and his family from the sinful world around them. He used the water to separate the Israelites from bondage, and sin is just another form of bondage. God used water to separate Naaman from the corruption that infected him with the leprosy. Sin is a corruption that affects us spiritually. God used water in the similar way many other times. The way God uses water in baptism really should not be a great shock, maybe not even a surprise to people. Certainly not such a big shock that they would resist it. God has done similar things so many times. And in these things, we, we want to notice in all of them, there's a pattern here, and that is the sequence of obedience and salvation. Noah obeyed God's plan and was saved from the wicked people around him. Moses obeyed God's plan, was saved from the bondage that threatened the people. Naaman obeyed God and was cleansed. And many people we read about in the New Testament obeyed God. And they were baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. 
So if there are those who have not done that today, if there's anybody here, or if you know anybody that's not done that, maybe you would like to explain to them the powerful and simple way that God has used water in the past. That's the way he's using it again today. People just have to understand. They have to understand the significance of what they're doing. Those who have reached the conclusion that they believe in God, they believe in Jesus as his son, that should change their minds, change their hearts, change their will. The Bible calls that repentance. Then they must acknowledge the process that saves them, that Jesus is the Savior. That man, Jesus, he is the Christ. He is the Son of God. They have to be willing to confess that with the mouth, the scriptures say. Confession is made into salvation and then be baptized. And those who are baptized can take part in one's God, in one of God's very unusual usage of water. It separates them from the guilt of their sin. If there's some way we can help you tonight, we'd be glad to try to do that. You'll come forward as we see. Dost thou count all things but Jesus for love? Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? What's in the crimson flood? Quins and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. Hast thou dominion or self and or sin? Is thy heart right with God? Over all evil without and within, is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? Washed in the crimson Cleanse and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. Are all thy powers unto Jesus controlled? Is thy heart right with God? Does he each moment abide in thy soul? Is thy heart right with God? Is thy heart right with God? What's in the crimson flood? Cleansed and made holy, humble and lowly, right in the sight of God. may be seated. Is there anyone this evening that needs to partake of the Lord's Supper? There we go. Psalm before the Lord's Supper will be number 283. 283. Jesus, keep me near the cross. Number 283. Jesus, keep me near the cross, there a precious fountain, free to all the healing stream, flows from Calvary's mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever, till my raptured soul shall find rest beyond the river, near the cross. Before me, 
me, help me walk from day to day with its shadows o'er me. In the cross, in the cross, be In John chapter 4, Jesus was speaking to the Samaritan woman at the well. He said this to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sometimes we sing about a fountain of Jesus' blood that's given for the remission of sins. And that fountain was opened at the cross. And it flows, and not only forward throughout all the future, but also back through the past. As Hebrews chapter 10, verses 8 through 10, the writer of Hebrews writes, Previously saying, Sacrifice and offering, burnt offerings, and offerings for sin you did not desire, nor had pleasure in them, which are offered according to the law. Then he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, O God, He takes away the first that he may establish the second. By that will, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. That fountain of blood that cleanses our sins, that was opened at the cross, is continuous for all time so that we only need one sacrifice. And yet, we remember that sacrifice every first day of the week. Did everyone get a community kit that needs it this evening? All right. Please pray with me. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the sacrifice of your Son so many years ago and for our stead. Lord, we thank you at this time for this bread that reminds us of his body that he gave freely, voluntarily, for our sakes, and for the sake of the whole world. Bless us as we partake. In Jesus' name, amen. Please pray with me again. Our Father in heaven, again we bow before your throne and we thank you for the blood that was shed that belonged to your Son, your only Son. We thank you for that unspeakable sacrifice that he gave to save us. Help us to remember that blood with this fruit of the vine, as we do every week, until he comes. In Jesus' name, amen. If you would, please put the uh, communion kit after it's finished in the back of the seat in front of you. There's a place there for it. It will be picked up after our worship services are over. Also, if you're giving, please leave in the contribution plates that are in the foyer as you leave. Thank you. All right, good evening once again. I'll go ahead and announce the, the final song, 191, Home of the Soul. If uh, those who like to go ahead and get ahead and start turning to that as I'm uh, making the announcements. Um, 
want to thank you all again for coming uh, back and worshiping with us this evening. Uh, we had two great lessons today, so thanks to both Stan and Scott for those those great lessons, and thank you, Sean, for uh, for your outstanding uh, song leading this evening. Um, we will continue with uh, the less restrictive mask wear, making it voluntary uh, for all who uh, choose to do so. And uh, if anyone is uncomfortable with the way the situation is, please let one of the elders know, just so we can see if we can, if there's anything we can do to accommodate your concerns. Um, this morning we had uh, a presentation for Mary Stewart. Thank you all for for uh, attending with us out at uh, Rudy's. That was a great time. Uh, Mary will, I'm sure, be writing a card to uh, it will be uh, presented here in the next week or so. But very grateful to to the congregation here for the love and the support that, uh, that she was shown. There'll be a youth devotional and activity at the building next Saturday, May 22nd, from 4 to 7. Sign-up list for the items to bring is on the youth bulletin board. Also mentioned this morning, Miranda Morell's friend. Friend's husband passed away from liver cancer, so please pray for their family. And congratulations to the Lee family. Tyler and Anita uh, now have a, a wonderful little baby boy, Caden Allen, born Thursday morning at 3 a.m., 7.7 pounds, 20 inches long. Uh, he's in the NICU, recovering, uh, but mom and dad are doing well. So. Uh, see Kathy Springer if you're able to bring a, a food item to help them out. Member encouragement forms are on the table outside the office, so please grab one of those. Fill out a card, make a phone call, encourage uh, brother and sister that uh, that's on the list may need uh, may need to hear from you. And the final uh, two more announcements: um, Vicky Ratcliffe, the sister of uh, Brother Ken. Passed away last night. Uh, she lives up in Austin. Uh, don't believe there are going to be any funeral arrangements or any any, any service arrangements at this time, uh, per her request. But we do ask that you uh, please pray for the Ratcliffe family. And the final final uh, announcement, a little sweet card was just handed to me. Uh, this is from Betty Gaiman. It says, uh, "To those who helped me, just a little thank you for everything." I wanted to thank you. I wanted to thank all those who used their time and gas to take me to New Braunfels for my radiation treatments. You will always be in my prayers. I love you all, Betty Gaiman. So that's sweet. Thank. You. I do want to thank everybody who was able to help her over the last several weeks. That made a, a big difference uh, for her. So thank you all for that. Let's be standing as we have our closing song and prayer. One hundred ninety one, home of the soul. <clears throat> if for the price we have driven after our labors are o'er, rest to our souls will be given on the eternal shore. Home of the soul, beautiful home, there we shall rest. Never to roam, free from all care, happy and bright. Jesus is there, He is the light. Up in the storm, lonely are we, sighing for home, longing for Thee. Beautiful home on the ransom beside a crystal sea. Yes, the sweet rest is remaining for the true children of God. Where there will be no complaining, never the chasing rod. Home of the soul, beautiful home, there we shall rest, never to roam, free from all care, happy and bright, Jesus.
Jesus is there. He is the light up in the storm. Lonely are we, sighing for home, longing for thee, a beautiful home on the ransom beside the crystal sea. Soon the bright homeland adorning, we shall behold the glad Lean on the Lord till the morning, trust till the night is gone. Home of the soul, beautiful home, there we shall rest, never to roam. Free from all care, happy and bright, Jesus is there. He is the light up in the storm. Lonely are we, sighing for home, longing for thee. Beautiful home on the ransom beside the crystal sea. Pray with me, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for the day, for our assembly here, for those who are able to be here and those who are able to watch on the Internet. Father, we thank you for your love and sending your Son. We thank you for his sacrifice and that through him we have a hope of eternal life. Father, we pray for our friends and loved ones who are in need of medical assistance, Father. We, those that have been mentioned earlier today, we ask that you'll be with the Trotter family, Father, for the Ratcliffe family, for the loss of their loved one. There are others that are in need of medical assistance. Father, we pray that for those of us that are aware of this, that we can support them and assist them. Father, we pray for the congregation. We pray for our elders, for our deacons. We pray for our country, Father. We pray that there are those that will turn back to you and seek your guidance. Father, we ask that you'll continue to be with us, keep us safe, and forgive us of our sins. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.